Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cropper here. Got Luke from Zero Gravity Media. Um, he is in Germany, and we're going to be discussing Germany for the purpose of understanding Europe today. And Germany is the richest com country in Europe. And blah blah blah. And everybody knows about Germany being so great and all this. So Luke, you live there. How long have you lived there? You're an objectivist. Say a couple words about that. And then why have you? Why are you there? Well, I've been here for three years. Um, yeah, I uh, guess you could say I'm an objectivist in as much as I've read pretty much everything and um, have, yeah, over the course of several years determined that uh, that's the right way to go. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, how I ended up here was I I'm originally from Texas. I went to Colorado for a year, then... Um, Somebody recruited me into a job in Belgium, so I lived in northern Belgium and then Brussels for about four months. That's actually where I met my wife now, was that same company. And uh, after that, I went out to San Francisco. I lived in San Francisco for five and a half years. That's where that's actually where I got into objectivism with San Francisco. And then, um, which is, you know, a whole nother story, but... Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then my wife came out to, my, my wife now, she, we, we had been talking for about a year, she came out to visit me, she's German, and um, I mean, after a month, it was pretty much just we both knew, and uh, she was in school, I was kind of in the middle of a career transition, so I decided I would come out here, and yeah, so now I've been out here, November will be three years. All right, so long enough to definitely have a feel for what's going on. Sure, yeah. Um, what do you think of... Germany compared to you've lived in Texas and in California. What do you think of Germany? Just your general into the infrastructure, how nice towns are. I know half of it was under the Iron Curtain, so half of it's got to be a little bit rough, or possibly is still a bit rough. But what do you think of the country overall? How much have you seen? What do you know? What can you say about it? Yeah, maybe right before we got on this call, you were kind of giving a an, uh, giving an explanation as to why you were interested in this, which I think was like some destiny Lauren Southern debate. And he was bringing up a bunch of statistics about Germany being the most, the wealthiest country. And I think that's definitely something that people generally think about Germany is that it's the wealthiest country in Europe. And perhaps it is. Um, but to, to more directly answer your question, and I, I think that was worth mentioning just because I think that's the paradigm that most people have about Germany, which that was my paradigm, which will inform how I'm about to answer your question here, which is that when I before I came to Germany, I thought it was the wealthiest country. And I, yeah, perhaps it is. I don't know by what standard, but perhaps it is. Um, I've heard Jarn Brooks say it's the most productive. Um, you know, and, and before I say anything, I just want to say I'm not like an expert on German the German economy, the German financial system, the German markets. I'm not an expert on it. I'm not going to purport to be. What I do have is a lot of firsthand data points that I've amassed over the course of three years of living here. Um, and when I, when I landed and was taking a train from uh, Frankfurt to the town where I live now, I remember, granted it was November, so it was miserable weather and uh, all the trees had fallen off, or all the leaves had fallen off the trees and I was taking the train to work the town that I live now. And I just kept, I, I remember thinking, I was like, God, this does not look like a first world country. Yikes. And I just, I, I just kept waiting for it to get better. And it, it just never, literally just never did. <laughs> what city was this in? I'm sorry. This was from Frankfurt. I don't want to give Frankfurt. out the town that I live in now, but it was from Frankfurt towards the Mannheim area. Right. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, and now is that, uh, maybe I should pull up a map to just look at, in a side window, but Frankfurt is that behind? It's the Rhine River Valley. Yeah. The, the Rhine River Valley. So that's in the west yeah. side of Germany. Yeah, yeah. It's in the uh, formerly American controlled part after World War Two. So after World War Two you had the you had the Brit British controlling one part, the French controlling one part, uh, and the Americans controlling one part. That was Western Germany, and then you had Eastern Germany, which the Russians controlled, the DDR. Yeah, so not not an area that was behind the Iron Curtain then, and you, you no think, no not at all. In wow. fact, I've I, I I have not been to a part of Germany. At least I don't think so. I've driven from Nuremberg to Prague, but I think that was that's all still Bavaria. And if you 
if you assert to somebody in Bavaria that that's Eastern Germany, they'll slap you in the face because Bavaria is like the Texas of Germany. <laughs> but um, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know exactly where those lines went down. I don't think anywhere between Prague and Nuremberg was part of part of the DDR. But as I understand it, uh, the DDR is actually quite nice now because first of all, you, you have all the politicians in Berlin, right? Uh, and then secondly, the politicians are also dumping money from West, you know, as soon as the, as soon as the, the iron curtain came down, as soon as the Berlin wall came down, um, you had, you had lots of money being sent from Western Germany to Eastern Germany to rebuild the roads and all these other sorts of things. Mm-hmm. So as I understand it, and, and I could be wrong because I've never been there, but as I understand it, as I've been told, the Eastern Germany is actually, I wouldn't say nice, but a lot of the, the roads are newer uh, you know, think infrastructure is newer, things like this. Yeah, because they had uh, no reliable sewage systems and stuff like that, and they had to do some basic stuff just to get it livable over there, for sure. Yeah, I don't know about that. Um, I, I work with a guy, and he's who who was formerly he grew up in DDR, and he didn't mention anything about that at all. Well, there's stuff like. Um, chlorination of the water and power plants and stuff or in you know the water supply and stuff that we have legal standards in the west i'm sure they have them in western europe Mm -hmm. and uh it's just nothing like that under communism so they would have had to put water purification and proper sewer system stuff like that anyway so there was big expenses that just had to be done or else they were going to be facing spread of disease and stuff like that and that kind of stuff happened under the Soviet system, but it wasn't talked about. It was censored. So, anyways, sorry, course, off the yeah. subject a little bit. Yeah, they no, did no, have no to. Worries. They had to spend a lot of really serious money um, to get East Germany up to speed. All right, so it looked pretty bad when you got there. And what do you think of it today? Now you've been there, you think that it's quite an advanced economy? Um, no, most certainly not. Um, there, there's a tech scene here. I mean, well, let me let me bounce this question actually back to you. Um, by what by what standard would you regard an economy to be advanced? Well, my opinion of Germany is that they have to export a lot to feed themselves because they have such such a high population in such a small country. So they don't they don't have a lot to show for it except bare survival at the end of the day. So they do export a lot. They've got BMW and Volkswagen mm-hmm. and Mercedes and all the stuff that they make. And then at the end of the day, they just sort of are there maintaining their country. Yeah. So, by what, by uh, did maybe I answered yeah, your question, maybe I did There's truth to that. I mean, it, it, Germany is a big net exporter, that's for sure, but... Oh... Well, I'll just wait for a second or two. Yeah, Germany's a big net exporter, and um, that's part of the reason I think they have such a an a, a reputation in Germany for being so productive. And this is oh, you're cutting out a little bit. Oh, you cut yeah, out. I, Sorry, yeah, you, you cut out you for cut like out. yeah, you cut out for like twenty or thirty seconds. So re say whatever you were saying. Yeah, sure. So um, yeah, I mean. As I understand it, yes, Germany is a is a big net net exporter, but you also have to remember that they went many many years under with with closed borders, and they had to they they learn had to learn how to grow all of their own food from within their borders, and German cuisine today is a holdover from that because it, it's very base ingredients. You know, a typical German dish is you know boiled potatoes, a gravy, uh, you know pork cutlet, you know schnitzel. Yeah. And, and that's it, you know, uh, sauerkraut, for example, very much base ingredients. It's just, it's literally just cabbage, salt, and dill, um, you know, and this is because they had to learn how to cook with like very basic ingredients that came from within their own borders. So, no, I mean, I don't think that, you know, they could close their borders tomorrow and be fine, in my opinion. I mean, maybe there would be like some, a little bit of food shortages here and there, but I mean, there are, the Germans you know, you have to give credit where it's due. They're hardy people and they figure out how to make it work, you know? Okay. Well, yeah, they do have a big trade balance, uh, because, uh, for, for whatever reasons, but so anyways, uh, so what do you think 
the future of Germany holds then? Do you think it's got a bright looking future or do you think it looks like they're going to have to have big change in order to move in a better direction? They're going to have to have big change for sure. The reason I say that, I, I think it starts with their education system. Um, the one thing when I came when I came to Europe, I, I came here under the assumption that like the United States education system is terrible. Oh, I can't wait to live in the metric world and and understand the European education system and on and on and on. And my God, I, that could not be further from the truth. Um, their education system is absolutely horrific compared to the United States. Um, and the reason I say that is because. How familiar are you with the German school system? Um, well, I know that I think probably from what you told me that uh, you get put into a, on a track to either go to college or not. And if you get on the track to go to college, you get to go to college. But if you don't, then you can't go to college. And college is free. It, yeah. Yeah. Um, so at the age of 10, children get separated out into three different systems. It's called Realschule, uh, which is the middle tier. Then you get Hauptschule which is the lowest tier, and then you get gymnasium. Um, Hauptschule kids, they uh, then, then Hauptschule is further divided into, so it's, so it's Hauptschule is bottom, Hauptschule is middle, gymnasium's the highest, the, the, those are the kids going to college. Um, Hauptschule is further divided into two more categories, which is those with English class and those without English class. So if you are Eng English class, and the, the people who decide which kid goes into which school system again it happens at the age of 10 and it's your fourth grade teacher so in the fourth grade your your fourth grade teacher decides if you are going to go to college or if you're going to go to Realschule or if you're going to go to Hauptschule and if you're a Hauptschule kid which the most most of them are I believe it's about 60 percent um again they get further divided out into um English like like you get a year or two of English or you don't get a year or two of English. And if you don't get the year or two of English, then you are destined to a life of um, mail delivery, trash pickup, things like this. Wow. Um, so it's almost like a class or caste system just put in place through the education system. Oh, totally. 100, 100%. Okay. Like 100%. At the age of 10, uh, if you are not... Realtrula, your life is on a path. You leave the country or you are a worker. That's it. There's And you can reverse it. You can change it. But it is prohibitively difficult. You have to go to – you have to make up for all of that schooling that you missed out on, which they, they finish up about age 14 or 15. So you have to – and you don't finish gymnasium until 19. So you have to do full-time night and weekend school for like five straight years – just to get Arbitur, which is the certification that you need, the certificate that you need to apply for university. So um, if, you get, if you get put into Hauptschule, which again, there's, you know, 60% of kids do, then um, you are going to be a trash pickup person. Or um, if, you take the, if, you, if you take the year or two of English, then you'll go into the apprenticeship program. And so, you know, you hear a lot of president, you know, people, presidential candidates on the left, you know, Buttigieg, I know, has said this, where they're like, oh, yeah, oh, we need to we need to really model uh, your Germany's apprenticeship program. The apprenticeship program is a way of uh, putting people into lanes out of which they'll never escape mm. at the age of 14. So my brother in law, for example. Um, actually my wife and I were just talking about this yesterday. My brother-in-law, he became an electrician. So he went and did his apprenticeship at 15. And my wife said the second day he came home, uh, and he was like, God, this is miserable. And he's like, I can't imagine doing this for the rest of my life. And then my wife said, yeah, a year later, there he was doing his apprenticeship. And, wow. uh, you know, by the age of 18, uh, you know, he was a full-time electrician and, uh, but now, you know, in Germany, the dream is that everyone starts off owning their own company and working for themselves. And that's suboptimal because you don't get the bennies, you don't get the vacation, you don't get any of that. So, so you start out working for yourself with the end goal of finding a job and working for someone else. 
and uh, and the the best thing you can do is work for the government. So, um, you know, he ended up working at a you know, wastewater treatment facility in a town nearby, um, and you know he's he's riding it out till retirement, so 40, 45 years, and um, and so yeah, I mean that's sixty percent of the kids. So electrician, plumber, um, any sort of anything like this, cook, baker anything like this. If you don't go the English route in your Hauptschule, then you're going to be the baker's assistant, the shop assistant, things like this. Um, so that's 60% of kids. You know, you juxtapose that against the... And so 60% of kids in Germany do not have an education beyond the age of 14 to 15 years old. So wow. you juxtapose that, you know, you, you try to take that and compare it to something like an American education system where almost everybody has what in Germany would be regarded as gymnasium. And you're, you just ask yourself, how are, the, how are those two countries going to compete? You know? Um, I, used, so, I used to worry about the American education system because I knew it was so terrible and we're always 27th in math and 49th in history and we're always way at the bottom of stuff. And yeah. I used to worry about that and then I thought, well, then why are we so far ahead of the rest of the world economically? So I stopped worrying about it because I thought apparently once we get out of school, then then the economy sorts us out. I mean, like Bill Gates dropped out of college and did his thing. So in America, the economy sorts you out. But you're saying that you can't get sorted out without the school system being behind you in Germany. You have to go through the school system. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, my brother-in-law, he he would he wants to be a farmer, but it's just impossible. You know, he can't do that at this point. It's, it's, you know, he's an electrician for the rest of his life and that's what it is. Why couldn't he just go buy some land and farm? Because it's extremely difficult. All the land is already owned. If they sell it to, um, you know, they sell it to the, the kids inherit it. You know, the, being a farmer in Germany is a good deal. I mean, it, it, there is not a plot of land. It, this is something else that you need to understand about Germany is that there is not a single plot of land in this inside of the borders of this country that is not some it, – it, it does not have to answer to a municipality. Hmm. Nowhere in this entire country. So if you buy a piece of land and you want to build a home on it, you have to go to the municipality and you have to ask permission, even if it's in the middle of nowhere. Uh, there's no concept of property rights here. So, you know, you've got, you've got a bad education system, people massively undereducated, um, way performing way under their potential, given the access, you know, given the access to knowledge that the everyday person has today, uh, coupled with virtually no property rights. So, um, the, the 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 house that we live in I li we live in a flat there's two units below us and then right next to us are my parents in laws and then there's another flat <clears throat> on the other side of them and uh, my my mother and father in law they wanted to put a window in because one side of their house which is the which is the south facing side of the house where the sun would would shine right has no windows so they wanted to put a window in but you have to go to your neighbors so what you what you have to do is you have to hire an architect the architect comes. They draw, up, they draw up plans, they submit it to town hall, and then letters get sent from town hall to all your neighbors, and then all your neighbors have to go there and grant you permission to do the work, to do the construction on your own home. Um, and one neighbor said to them that, no, I don't want you to have that window because it would look out at my house. So they couldn't put the window in. And every square centimeter in Germany is controlled that way. Everywhere. You, you, you can't just go buy a farm. I mean, you could, but we're talking millions and millions and millions of euros, something that's way beyond the grasp of somebody like my, my brother-in-law. <clears throat> wow. So America really is the land of opportunity, even today. You know, they, they, don't even under, they don't even fathom it. They, they, they have absolutely no concept of the freedoms that we have in America. Absolutely no concept. They, they can't even understand it. They, just yesterday... Um, you know, my wife, she's wanting to get her PhD and just yesterday, her parents started coming down on her. Why are you studying so much? Your brother's been paying into the system now for almost 20 years. You know, you're not going to have any retirement. They, they don't save. This is the thing is like, if something happens in Germany, some, some major economic event, like hyperinflation, these people are going to be left with nothing. 
They, they literally believe that what you ought to do in your life is work for 45 years and then um, subsist on your retirement, which is generally about 1,000 euros and 400, 1,400 euros a month, which is below the poverty line. So you work for 45 years uh, and then you subsist below the poverty line through your retirement and then you die. And that to them is like, that's the ideal. That's what you're after. Um, it, it's, and, and so, yeah, my mother and father-in-law talking to my wife yesterday about, you know, Luke is working and blah, blah, blah. And they just, they don't get it that like, we can go somewhere like America or Australia and earn so much more money, double our incomes, um, and be putting the amount of money that my brother-in-law is going to make over the course of his entire retirement after having worked for 45 years and paying into it, we'll make in a year or two in America, you know, and we can put that away or an interest on it in, in the Germans. And I'm convinced this is Europeans in general have no concept of any of that. It, it is outside of their realm of thought entirely. And if there's an economic event here, a major one, you're going to see huge, huge, huge problems because nobody here has money. Nobody has anything except what the government promises them. So they live paycheck to paycheck, basically. Everybody does, yeah. I, I don't even know if, like, investing in mutual funds or Roth IRAs, I don't even think that's a thing here. I, I don't think anybody does it. Because, that, because to them, that's risky. You know, the surefire shot is getting it from the government because it's always going to be there. But if you put it in mutual funds, oh, don't do that. That's, that's, in, that's the stock market. Oh, that's just a slot machine. That's just the bankers and the money they play with. Totally. Yeah. They avoid, especially Germans. I can't speak about the French. I can't speak about the, the Spanish on this, but the Germans, they, they avoid the stock market like the plague. Well, in Germany fact, is the richest and most advanced economy in Europe. Supposedly. Yeah. I, I have yet to see it. I mean, you know, you drive across the border to the Netherlands or to Belgium uh, or to Luxembourg, of course, Luxembourg, but you know, Switzerland, Austria, Netherlands, Belgium, you drive in any direction. I can't speak about Poland, but you drive in any direction and like, boom, the roads improve. Um, it's nicer. Everything's nicer. I think Germany gives away so much money to other countries. Um, and that's what my wife tells me too. That's what the EU is all about to Germany is, you know, bringing Germany down and everybody else up. Um, now I don't know that for sure. Uh, I, I have data points on that just through firsthand observation, you know, but um, you know, you'd have to get somebody else that, that really understands what's, what's happening financially, you know, and financial relationships between the various EU countries to, to, to that really validate that beyond what I just simply observed. But, um, I mean, and even within Germany, you know, you go from one state to the next and you can immediately see roads improve roads deteriorate. I mean, we, my, my parents were visiting about a month ago. We went to lower Saxony, which is up towards, Bremerhaven, which is an old port up there. We were going on a cruise. I swear to God, like we, we crossed from Bavaria to Lower Saxony. And I told, I <laughs> turned to my parents. I was like, this is, this is not a first world country. Like when I say country, I mean Lower Saxony, which is just a state. I was like, this, this, this is a second world place is what it feels like. Um, so, I mean, even places in Germany, it's just, I don't know, man. It's, it's, I, I, when people are like, oh, Germany's so wealthy and advanced, I don't, I don't know by what standard, I don't know what they're talking about. I mean, maybe the rest of Europe just really is that poor, but yeah, you, you see, you, you see the Netherlands and you see Belgium. I can tell you those places are nice. Belgium's awesome. Netherlands is awesome. I love those places. I mean, the French, they have great roads. Um, I haven't spent a lot of time in France, but. Um, you know, Switzerland is super wealthy, even though I know they're not part of the EU. And I was in Vienna in June. Uh, you know, that place felt super wealthy, super chill, like a lot of good time. And, you know, Germany, you know, there's parts of Germany that's nice. But again, man, I just look at all these little data points. Like there's a I, how much German do you speak? Uh, ich spreche nur ein bisschen Deutsch. OK, kein problem. Um, <laughs> there is um there's a word in German called Stamstisch. Have you ever heard of it? Nein. Okay. Um, so that's German for standing table. And it used to be a thing where um, people would just, they, they, you'd have your, your village restaurants, right? And 
so people should also understand that like most people in Germany do not live in cities. They live in villages outside of cities and they've, you know, their family has lived in these villages for farther back than they can even trace. So, um, actually I had one guy on the internet arguing to me one time about how, you know, the, the suburban development housing policies in America, just wait till they get to Germany. I'm like, you have no idea what you're talking about. These people have lived in these villages for longer than your family's been in America. I can assure you that, but whatever the case. Um, so there's these like little villages everywhere. And then you have these restaurants in, in these villages, these traditional German restaurants and all these people, they have these stamps dish, which is that you've got a standing reservation at a restaurant. You never have to call it in. It's just, you know, old German village restaurant. And so, you know, 8 PM on Wednesday and you and all your friends go there and you just drink beer and eat dinner. And it, it's called stamp dish. And it, it's just, and so you and your friends have an 8 p.m. Wednesday stamp dish. Maybe your neighbor and his friends, they've got a Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. stamp dish, you know. And that is something that is fleeting, that's going away, that doesn't really exist anymore. People don't actually really do that because all of those restaurants are closing. Um, what, so for the, fast food or to eat at home or what? People eat at home. Groceries are so cheap, nobody can afford to eat out. I mean, my, my in-law family, we eat out maybe twice a year. We cook at home every every meal. They think it's odd, you know. As an American, I want to go eat out all the time, and that, that it's just mind boggling. They're it's just, you can't spend the money. So that's totally. a sign of poverty, then. Oh, totally. Yeah, I mean, fireplaces are making a comeback. People are installing fireplaces everywhere because no one can afford to heat their homes. Um, so 19th century heating techniques, hot water bottles, fireplaces are making a huge comeback. Oh. Um, God. Yeah, it's uh, it's not it's not good, man. Because energy prices are, you know, they've increased year over year over year over year. Now we you know, the, now you know why that is, right? Well, yeah, they literally have a Merkel, the government. They literally have a fascist control over the energy market. So Merkel literally dictates what the energy prices for the next year will be. But and it's a big thing here. But they the, go, oh, here's next year's energy prices. But the reason that it's going so high is because of solar panels and. Uh, and uh, windmills. Mm. Mm. I promise. I, I promise. Yeah, I it, promise. but that's not the reason, though. I mean, it, it, that may be the reason behind the reason, but but the the reason that you see, the reason that the direct reason is from a government dictate on energy prices. Like that's literally well, what they, happens. They wouldn't they say, do that if it were just the coal plants running. Now they've got the coal plants plus all the solar panels and the windmills. And yeah, they've got the same that's number the of behind the reason. Yeah, yeah, they got the same number of coal plants as they ever had. They've just added a hundred billion dollars worth of windmills and solar panels to the picture. Yeah. Yeah, and um, they also mandate that, it, like, so my brother-in-law bought a house, um, and again, I mean, you know, I don't need to like, go on and on about myself, but, you know, like, my best understanding in all this is first-hand data points, but, you know, my brother-in-law bought a house um, with uh, putting my parent-in-law's house on collateral, um, mortgaged it to get the son a house, and... Uh, they, they, you know, as a total redo, they had to redo everything. And part of that, you had to do, you had to put in a $50,000 solar panel, you know, so about a $250,000 house, probably put in a hundred grand worth of work, uh, and then $50,000 or Euro, 50,000 Euro solar panel. Now that doesn't even make sense a lot of the year. And, uh, it's so cold and dark so far North in Germany. Does it make sense? For his house, do you think is it working for him, or has he had it long enough to know, or what do you think, or well, do you think you know, that's a good thing? Is that just progress forced by the state? What do you think of that? Oh, it's totally forced by the. I mean, it's forced by the state. Like he 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 had to do it if he wanted to do the work on his house. They legally he had to do it. He was forced to do it, you know. But he was trying to, and like you know, I know he's not an objectivist or anything. What you know, whatever. You know, so he's kind of trying to rationalize it out so he doesn't feel taken advantage of or anything like this. And so he's like, yeah, you know, I think it'll save me about, you know, 600 euros a year on energy, you know. And I was like, oh, let's see the math. You know, solar panel lasts about this long before it needs to be replaced. And I was like, actually, yeah, you're not going to actually make your money back. You're going to lose your ass on that. And then you're going to have to spend another 50 grand 
and then lose your ass on that one too. Um, and I actually did, I didn't, I didn't have the heart to tell him that I told my wife that I was like, you can tell him if you want, but I'll let him live in his, you know, blissful ignorance on that. But, um, yeah, I, I told my wife, I was like, yeah, he's losing his ass on this. Even if it's saving him a few hundred bucks a year, he spent 50 grand on it and it's going to have to be replaced in 20 years. Yeah. yeah. So that's the government forcing you to buy exorbitantly overpriced, um, religious ablutions that's just a that's just a, a religious a religious for the green uh, religion it's just a sacrifice to the green gods that's what solar panels are 100 percent. yeah and, and the because state. you because, because you lose your ass on them um because the, the amount of money you save each year you have to you're gonna have to replace it way long before you ever make the money back on it it's gonna go out of you're just gonna have to replace it it's not gonna be useful anymore yeah, and a fifty thousand's a hell of a lot. Is that enough to run his whole damn house? No, no, not even close. I mean, it, it, this is the thing. He still has a fireplace. He installed a. He actually bought a huge, enormous fireplace, and even that's not enough to heat his home wow. in the winter time. What to burn coal or wood or whatever? Wood. Yeah, wood. People are turning back to wood here. Wow. Of course not coal. Of course not coal. No, for sure. God forbid. Well, that's very scary because um, wood, leaving wood behind and going to coal really helped spark the Industrial Revolution. Coal is so much more energy dense than wood. Yeah, well, I mean, here's the thing is just wait till, wait till everyone starts going back to wood here to save money. There's not enough forest. I mean, Europe was not forested. Like, it, it, Europe, the European forests are much more lush and bigger than they were few hundred years ago because everybody used to cut down trees to heat during the winter time so yeah. just wait till like all of these many more millions of people start using all this wood and it's going to be a real problem then wood prices are going to go up because oh god we can't thin out the forests too much we need our forests so now wood prices are going to go up and they're i mean what are you going to do then there's nothing else to go to they don't use they don't use modern building technology they build their buildings out of brick and plaster. No insulation, no central HVAC, just wall heaters, oil-based wall heaters, um, which, again, people try not to use because they're so expensive now. Um, the uh, So they're installing fireplaces. They're using hot water bottles in bed, using hot water bottles, and they watch movies on the couch to stay warm. Um, it's just... I don't know what to say about it, man. Wow. You know, it reminds me of in Japan, I heard about this thing that I thought was pretty neat until I realized it's a real sign of poverty. They have a heater underneath their table, so when they sit and eat dinner, there's sort of heat emanating out from underneath their table. Uh, and then I, then I realized that's the only source of heat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's not really that romantic. It's like... Uh, uh, you freeze your butt off everywhere, and that's why when you sit to have a meal, you have a little bit of heat coming out there so you don't freeze. So, oh, yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you what, man, Central HVAC, people have absolutely no idea how modern and and superior that is to literally every other city. The American home, like everybody listening to this should understand, like the American home, do not let a European like shame you about, oh, your crappy housing. The American housing is built for a purpose, and that is to keep your shit cool in the summer and keep it warm in the winter. And and that's it, like and to be comfy. That's that's the American house, you know. Come live in Europe, where you've got porous plaster brick walls with no insulation, and you're going to get mold building up unless when it's freezing cold, zero degrees Celsius outside. You have to open your windows every single day to get what the Germans call Frische Luft. And if you don't do that, then you get moldy walls. We actually had to replace all the wallpaper in our living room because of this. Um, so you, you, just when your home is like nice and toasty in the morning when you wake up, oh, guess what? You got to open all the windows, freeze it out, and then heat it back up again uh, to get all the humidity out. You know, it, it, like it, it's just it, it's just asinine the idea that that American the American building standards and American homes are the best in the world. Now you wouldn't are, have that problem. Not. You wouldn't have the problem with the cycle of condensation and moisture and stuff if you kept it at an even uh, temperature all night. 
Yeah, for sure. And you have central HVAC again, yeah. constantly pumping in like fresh air from the outside, fresh filtered air. Yeah. And I was talking about this on our show, HSP, about how, you know, like I'm not interested in being, you know, one with nature and having fresh air. You know, I'm not interested in being one with allergy season. Yeah. You know what I mean? I want HEPA filters. I want that shit clean when it comes into my house, you know? Yeah, one time I took my camera out in the backyard and set it on a branch to do a little a little video in the backyard. And pretty soon I had mosquitoes and bugs and flies. <laughs> yeah. I said, great, I'm out here in nature, great. Yeah, dude, and that happens. Man, this is another thing, like going back to this environmental environmentalist thing and the, the fascism around it all. It's like our town recently banned even green plastic bags for vegetable trash. Green? So what do you mean have, green? Well, we have three different kinds of trash. We've got black trash, which is sort of the, you know, the super non-recyclables and all this sort. Of. And then you've got, uh, then you've got green trash, which is like, um, you know, your basic plastics and and papers and things like this. And then you've got brown trash, which is just nothing but vegetables, produce, meats, any biodegradables like this, right? Well, it used to be the case that for the brown trash, you could use these like biodegradable plastic bags, right? Well, our our town recently banned those. So you can't even use the biodegradable plastic bags. You just have to dump the vegetables raw into your trash can. Well, during the summertime, um, you have to – then everyone figured out, well, you have to kind of put a stick in there to ventilate your trash can because now you've, it's filled with rotting vegetables. So – then what that does is it attracts flies everywhere. Well, because nobody has central HVAC, everyone has to leave their windows open, so then the flies come into your house. So now we have like a town-wide fly infestation everywhere coming into your house. Um, these meat-eating wasps, they're called European hornets, are like all coming around everywhere, and it's actually illegal to kill the hornets. You can't kill the nest. You can't kill the hornets. I think it's something like... Uh, you know, up to a thirty thousand euro fine or something. Nobody would ever get fined that, but it's just a just a just a deterrent so that you don't kill these hornets. You know, so God forbid. You know, so they 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 ban these biodegradable plastic bags, attract a bunch of flies and hornets, and then there's laws in place that you can't kill any of the hornets. So you your kids running around in the house with hornets coming in the window. Just it, it, dude, it is it is. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, I I enjoy many facets of living here, and um, you know, we're gonna we're gonna leave at some point, but we're gonna spend like you know the summers here and Christmas and stuff. Christmas is fantastic in Germany. They've got Christmas villages everywhere. It's great, but like the 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 controls. It, this this is far and away, far and away the most unfree place I've ever lived. I mean, people that want to bitch and complain about the United States, it's like I get it. That's the that's the bastion the last bastion of, of hope. Um, and we need to, to save it, but it's like, you don't know anything. So you've lived in Europe or, or I can't even imagine a place like, I mean, this is the thing is like in China, you know, I know you watch that serpent ZA guy, you know, he was talking one time, he was like, China is like incredibly free, but not on paper. And when they want to enforce the laws, they enforce them and you're screwed at that point. But if you want to, go out into the street at uh you know one in one o'clock in the morning and start welding on your motorcycle then you know no one's gonna say anything people will be annoyed but it, you can do it so it's 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 at once like free and and right up until it's not you know <laughs> um but yeah like I, I don't know about russia but my god dude like europe is not not that at all it's it's straight up um I, yeah straight up authoritarian um and the people are used to it they don't complain they don't bitch especially the germans you know the german pushes back on that oh oh my god we've got the uh we've got the neo-fascist right on the rise now uh because they want to use biodegradable bags in their vegetable trash you know yeah, so it's they, like the germans it's like they are a, they are a stay in your lane society now, what do you think about, or what can you say about uh, immigration? I don't know if it's even, if you're even allowed to speak on it. Um, yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't say a lot about it because, 
um, yeah, I mean, there's just no such thing as freedom of speech here either. But um, I mean, I can, you know, I can, I can give the honest report on the ground, which is that, um, I mean, there's a few things to say about it. We should probably talk a little bit about, like, give a little bit of context as well. So in the, I think it was the 1950s, the 1960s, they were really worried about um, labor shortage, which anybody, if you've ever heard a government talking about labor shortage, just know that that's a euphemism for tax shortage, and they're worried about their Ponzi scheme going under. That's all labor shortage is. Um, so they brought in a whole bunch of Italians and a whole bunch of Turks, I think it was in the 60s. Um, and the Italian, most of the Italians went back, a lot of them stayed, um, but all the Turks stayed. Now, interestingly, the Turks have actually quite well integrated. They've done a really, they, they kind of maintain their own culture. Um, you know, they've got their kebab stands, they, but they all speak German. A lot of them have good jobs. They've taken apprenticeships. They're actually, um, actually we, we, we got, we get our water from a spring. And, um, I asked my wife just a couple days ago, I was like, why is it that all the Turk? It's like, I never see Germans here. Why does it, why is it only Turks here? Like gathering the spring water with us? She's like, cause Germans are lazy. They just want it out of the tap. And, um, and I was like, oh, okay. You know, so the, the, the Turkish are actually, you know, they've integrated. Um, they speak German. They also speak Turkish. Um, and they have their own little communities, their own little, you know, but they don't cause problems. They've got their own thing going on. Um, now, I just and, have to pause for a second there and mention you're getting spring water. Um, someone 2,000 years ago might think that in the future people are quite advanced, but there you are, and I happen to know you're eating uh, garden-grown veggies and eating fresh meat mm -hmm. from a local butcher, and then drinking spring water, too, living in Germany, in the heart of Europe, in a supposedly a very, very developed nation. So... Uh, yeah, our water is super, super calcium. There's so much calcium in our water. So, like, every couple of months, all of our pipes are completely calcified shut, and we have to get a plumber to come dig all the calcium out. Wow. That um, bad. So, and, and also my, my brother-in-law, he works at that wastewater treatment facility. So, apparently, him and one of his coworkers a couple of years ago, before I came here, brought their, brought their tools over to sort of measure the water quality, and apparently it's not very good. So he was like, you can drink it, but don't drink too much of it. So, um, so anyways, yeah, I mean, we just gather, we just take, you know, 30 or 40, like 10 liter jugs. No, not 30 for like 20, 20, 10 liter jugs ish. And we just fill them up about once a month. And that's pretty much our water supply for the month. Um, but, uh, yeah. So, so the Turkish are, you know, they're, they're not a problem, you know, like they, they don't view themselves as Germans. Germans don't view them as Germans. They're, you know, they consider themselves two different distinct ethnic groups, but they coexist perfectly fine, perfectly peacefully. Many times they're intermarrying, um, and it, it, there's no problem. You know, they've integrated. They speak German. They also speak Turkish. They've got their little communities off to the side. Um, you know, Turkish tailors are very, very good. So, you know, if you've got a suit that you need tailored, you take it to a Turkish person, you know, this sort of thing. So very much like, not unlike something you'd see in Manhattan, you know, um, or any major American city for that matter. But then, um, yeah, then you've got another, you, you've got two other groups of Im immigrants coming into Germany. One of them is sort of the Arab and Middle Eastern uh, Muslim immigrants, um, which you would, that's what you would generally think of an American would think of when you hear the word refugee is you'd think of that. But then there's this whole other group, which people don't really think about, which is from, these are the Africans, like North Africans, but a lot of them aren't actually North Africans. They come from all over Africa. Um, and so these are generally the people that you'd think of as being an economic migrant. Um, and so those are the two groups now, but, but in Germany, they call them both, they, they call all of them refugees. Um, I have to say, I think I think a lot of people on the right are they they miss this a bit. I don't think it's nearly as much of a problem as people think. Um, yes, it's true. The vast majority of them that don't work, they live on the benefits of society, um, but they're not necessarily at the same time causing a whole bunch of problems. 
where you see problems exist is when you allow for massive areas to be taken over by these cultures that have ideas that are opposed to Western ideas. And basically, most ideas that are opposed to Western ideas are destructive ideas. So it's these places in London and Paris and these sorts of things where you see these massive takeovers, takeovers of parts of the city where you see these awful atrocities uh, happen. Um, but in Germany, it's really interesting because they've deliberately dispersed all of these people to, to the point where there's no like big massive go-to area where they all flock to. Um, so they'll put a few in this village, they'll put a few in that village, they'll put a few in this village, they'll put a few in that village, but it's not like Calais, France, where they just like, they throw them all in this giant encampment. You know what I mean? Um, so I, I would say it's not that big of a problem in Germany, um, outside of an economic problem. Um, how is it an economic problem? Just getting them into the economy and getting them jobs and stuff? Or? <laughs> well, yeah, dude. I mean, let's go back to the beginning of our conversation when you talk about these apprenticeships. Yeah. Like, I am a college-educated person, okay? Like, I work in software development. I'm smart. Like, I can figure things out. I could not go get a job as an electrician. I would have to go through a two-year-long apprenticeship program. And then I could get a job as an electrician, but not until I turn learn, not until I learn German. So when you talk about a, um, a guy from Namibia showing up in Germany, and then you think about like the kind of work that he might be able to do, plumbing, electrician work. I mean, do you think that a German employer is going to hire him when he doesn't speak German and he hasn't gone to school and he hasn't qualified for anything? No, it's a non-starter for these people to find work. It's a non-starter. Maybe they'll find work as a, as a, as a cook. Some of them have found work, you know, found work, at, you know, as as cooks. In fact, that's what I did when I first came here. Was uh, when I worked as a cook. In fact, I worked with like Syrian refugees and Iraqi refugees. I actually worked with a guy that, um, drove. He did a very dangerous job driving trucks for the American army. He was an I. I Iraqi national and he just drove drove trucks for the American army and you know told him my brother was there and a bunch of my friends went over there and you know we kind of had you know a moment where we were talking about that and he really liked the Americans and so on and so forth and you know so it really is all over the place man um, you can't really just say there's Germans and then there's immigrants it's it's much more it's much more nuanced than that like and for example like the Turks they hate the Muslim immigrants they hate them because the Muslim immigrants are bringing in their, you know, hardcore culture, right? And then the Turks are like, yeah, when they look at you, they think the same thing about me. And so they hate the Muslim immigrants. So the Turks are like on the German side against the Muslim immigration. And people, they, they, that distinction is lost on them entirely. You know, and then you have this whole other group of people which are the Africans, you know, and they're just trying to get the hell out of Africa. A lot of people don't even realize that most of them are actually from, you know, wealthier families in Africa. I mean, do you honestly think that, you know, somebody who, you know, is in extreme poverty in Africa has the money to come over to Europe? No. Like the, the people that come over to Europe from Africa are people with money, yeah. you know, and they're paying, they're paying people to get them here with money, you know. It's super impoverished people in Africa don't have that. And then they get over here and they're like, shit, I can't find work. What am I going to do? You know, like it might work in America where like, yeah, cool. I'll pay you a dollar an hour to sweep my floor. I mean, you know, would have worked 150 years ago, but now you have minimum wage laws that presents, you know, prevents this from happening. But, you know, it worked in America in the 1800s because they just would show up and yeah, yeah. You want to sweep my shop floor for 50 cents an hour? Okay. <laughs> or sure. when... When more people show up, um, then economic projects become possible that weren't possible before. So where yeah. it used to be you had to pay $2 an hour to get your workers. Now all of a sudden there's a bunch of them willing to work at 50 cents an hour. And you say, well, shit, I'll open up two factories then, not just one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, totally. That's a great point. Um, but that's not a reality here in Europe. It's so control. Everything is so controlled. Everybody has their own little path and they're, they're separated at a young age into this direction and that direction. You know, when you start thinking about introducing 30 and 35 year old um, 
migrants from other countries who don't speak the language and haven't done apprenticeship programs and weren't educated in that way, it's a non-starter. They, they, they get here and then they're just like, well, shit, I came all this way for this. That, and that's their attitude, you know. That's why they're actually a lot of them are quite resentful of the whole thing. They spent all this money to get here only to realize they can't get a job. Yeah, and I've heard a lot of a lot of people in France and a lot of people who end up in Sweden and in London, uh, same sort of thing. They're locked out of the upper class white um, educated intelligentsia, nice upper class society, and the lower class society doesn't have any room for them because it doesn't have any room for the lower class people who are already there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're locked out of society entirely. You know, it's just it's it's the whole thing is a non-starter. Well, um, I'm also talking with the guy in France about how bad it is there, and uh, yeah, France is different than Germany. Now, the western part of Germany is the most advanced part, and I mean the far western part. Uh, there's the, uh, the this group of cities around Cologne, Bonn, Dusseldorf, mm -hmm. um, and it's been pointed out to me that most of the wealth and technology in the history of France comes from from Belgium and the Netherlands. And I wonder if that might be true of Germany. It looks like a lot of their, uh, the advanced building in their countries right over there by Netherlands and Belgium. So uh, France doesn't even get any points for being an advanced country. It gets it all from the little Hong Kong on its northern border. And I wonder yeah. how much that's true in Germany, too. I don't know. Um, I can tell you that there's something odd working in these kinds of companies in Germany because they use a lot of like corporate speak and you're just kind of, it kind of throws you off a little bit at first. You know, they're like, you know, what we need to do is we need to, we really need to tackle this low hanging fruit, you know, this sort of thing. We need to, we need a paradigm shift here, guys, you know, and moving kind of forward, like, moving forward, we need to think outside the box. Yes. This sort of thing. And you're kind <laughs> of like, yeah, this, this language is still exciting to you. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, I don't know, man. It's something weird. It's like you, you just like strangely know that they're behind the times. You know what I mean? I think it's politically correct. Safe. It's safe language. I mean, you find that in, in some some places in America, too. It's in You find it certainly in the universities and places like that. Politically correct. Say You say only th things that are safe, and that limits you to stupid bromides that you heard yesterday. Yeah, but I don't think it's that. I think they honestly believe that they're saying something really like groundbreaking when they say that we need to go after the low-hanging fruit. <laughs> it reminds me of the British who are always saying something like, that's true and we need to stop and think about this. <laughs> like they're constantly yeah, saying some stupid garbage. Well, yeah. um, well uh, I've got another guy who wants to speak to me from Norway, so I should probably let you go here, Luke. All right, man. No worries. Yeah. Thanks for the talk, and we'll speak on Sunday, <clears throat> if that works out, about yeah. what's the other thing I want to speak to you about. Oh, how how the, the alt-right turned from, from sort of scattered and not knowing what they were doing to let's have an ideology. And Gavin yeah, sure. McGinnis has started going back to church. Have you heard about that? No, but I'm not surprised. This is a big thing with a lot of these. Like I said, they, a lot of them are traditional. They, they're turning towards traditions. Yeah. We need to go back to our traditions, our roots, back when, back before things were all messed up. That's, that's, it all got messed up when we all you know, started having sex before marriage and you know, this sort of thing. Yeah, that'll solve yeah. the problem. Just go back in time. Go, start going to church again. <laughs> yeah, dude, totally. All right, man. Well, let's talk on Sunday. All right. Thanks a lot, Luke. Talk to you later. All right, man. Sounds good. Later. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining me. If you like these interviews and talks that I do and you like me to um, inform and educate you on the things that I think need to be informed and educated on, then please go to Patreon and give me 5 or $10 a month and support my uh, activities. <laughs>